Um, so uh, what I what I have to talk about today, and I think it's uh, I think you'll find it quite fun. I really do, even if it comes across as a little bit serious at the beginning. So I found, what I did was to adapt a talk I gave about a year ago. So some of you may know I do kind of hang out in Egypt a fair bit. Um, and I have been working with somebody called Mahmoud professionally on strange ideas and projects. And many of you have met Mahmoud because he was at the um, Clayton. I don't remember which exact party it was, but he had a, the blowtorch, the blowpipe. The <laughs> South Sea Island party. That was it. The South Sea Island. So Mahmoud was the one that managed to, what did he do? He, uh, from a backward facing direction, he, he, what did he do? I think the game was to shoot a, a missionary with a blowpipe, but he, that was up, it. he threw something up, up backwards and hit the target very impressively and won a prize. That was it. Yes. Well, being Egyptian and knowing it was a missionary, that's probably, you know, he <laughs> could do it in the dark. So, um, so this is some work we put together around obelisks. So I'm uh, excited to share it with you. I've adapted it from what was uh, a kind of conference presentation in Bournemouth in 2019, but I've added in some funny bits. Um, so it is about obelisks and the kind of um, the way to introduce it is to say that this is about an idea about how the obelisks were raised, because it's been a puzzle that many people over centuries have been uh, attempting to solve, um, trying to solve physically as well as theoretically. So we came across some ideas and thought that we would put them into a book, which we did. So I'm going to show you what we did what we came up with. Um, and just to let you know, this is not an obelisk. So some of you may have seen this recently. This is not an obelisk. This is a monument. The giveaway is the word in the bottom of the screen that says monument. <laughs> but this was not from Egypt. This was reconstructed to be as inspiring as an obelisk. Um, this, however, is an obelisk. Uh, and the giveaway is that it looks very, very old and battered for a start. But this one's in Central Park. Um, and yes, it did arrive from Egypt many years ago. So um, we're going to be talking about this, not that one. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll kind of do this a bit quick, but this was for the sake of the conference. What we did was to come up with some ideas. We were like, how were these obelisks raised? So I'll have to declare that Mahmoud is the kind of engineering genius behind this. Um, so it was really his ideas. Um, I came along for the ride. Um, but what I did do was to help uh, formulate it into a kind of a, a way to present it, maybe you might talk about it, um, kind of to a more uh, academic type audience. So what we did is we started with something called systems thinking. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. Um, and we had a hypothesis about the raising of monolithic obelisks in Egypt, which are single stones. So a monolith just means it's a single stone. And we have a hypothesis that says that the fact that obelisks exist in pairs might have been important. So we did some experiments to test the idea in real life, and I'll show you pictures. And looking for the answer to this has lured the attention of adventurers for um, over a century. So um, what these are the kind of headings that we'll go through. If you notice all the way down towards the bottom, you'll see the word obelisk. So you have to kind of go with me on a what it, let's call it an indirect journey. It's a, like a series of hunches and clues that we followed in order to get to what we think is the solution. So you might be wondering, why is she talking about that? But it all kind of comes together at the end. So think of it as, I guess, um, you know, it's more like a Henry Poro detective or, a, you know, a, a, or an Agatha Christie novel where there's a plot twist at the end, but you have to wait for that. Um, so that is not Mahmoud on the left and that is not me on the right, but they were kind of appropriate characters to present the approach we took, which was, I think, I think a bit unscientific. I'm, I'm an architect. Mahmoud is more of an engineering mindset, but we certainly don't have PhDs uh, in Egyptology. However, we do have uh, a lot of curiosity. So where we started was the first clue was this idea of circularity. And it's terribly popular right now to talk about circularity because um, circular economy is the big phrase now. How do we make an, econ an economic system that 
minimizes waste and maximizes resources. So this is all sustainability. So our first clue was um, how Ellen MacArthur talks about this because, uh, and I know about this from my current work in universities, um, she talks about circularity having historical roots. It's not new. This idea of not having waste or reusing waste, um, it was done centuries ago as well as hundreds of years ago, any wartime. Um, but this idea of cycles is ancient, and it was the mindset of the people that held this kind of circularity about reuse, don't waste, don't pollute the environment. And it's a kind of just a very practical approach, you might say. Um, and the other point of this is that we started to see that these ancient civilizations in particular not only had this as a mindset, but they had a very cyclical way of thinking, which is a little bit like circular thinking, but this one is cyclical. Um, and I'll show you where this connects to Egypt in just a minute. So kind of non-linear. So just in short, this is what circularity is about in modern day time. How we don't do this, we use everything, and no product has a beginning or end. It just eternally gets used, so there's no waste. Um, and we figured out that, um, so that's the circularity bit, which I'll come back to, it connects to Egypt in a minute. The second one was systems thinking. And that's where you look at the big picture, not the small picture, or you look at the whole, not the parts. So we figured out that maybe some of the approaches to raising obelisks in the, pa in the past were looking at part of the problem, but not the kind of, for example, Egypt mindset or a, a kind of taking a step back and looking at it. So systems thinking is just a way to take a broader perspective. And we followed a hunch that said, what if Egyptians were systems thinkers in the past? And what if they carried a circular mindset? So we carried this kind of this direction through and started looking for clues. Um, and so just even, I mean, many of you have been to Egypt, but this idea of, you know, beauty is nature and perfection and circularity is its chief attribute. This was a more contemporary quote. However, in philosophy, it's very much true of Egypt. Um, this idea that everything kind of makes sense when you start to delve into the history of it. It's very layered. Um, and there's a, there is a lot of beauty in it as well. Um, so getting back to the circular and the cyclical, um, in the old days, uh, before I was born anyway, they had uh, three seasons in Egypt tied around the rising and fall of the Nile and the natural weather patterns as well. They don't really have this anymore because, of course, the Aswan Dam means that the Nile doesn't rise and fall anymore. Um, but in the past, they had three seasons. There was autumn, spring, summer, inundation, growth and harvest. So this was where, um, you know, one way that this all got managed was that during the inundation, uh, the farmers and the peasants worked on public buildings um, because they couldn't do any growing um, and they couldn't do any harvesting. So uh, the belief is that we have anyway, and there is some a lot of evidence for this, that um, the public worked on huge projects. Um, so that's a proposal because other people believe that the slaves built everything. Um, but we think this is probably the one that's more likely, although that's I'm still debated now about, you know, is that what happened? Um, and just going with this cyclical view of life, we started to figure out that this idea of rhythm and cycles and balance in life is very much an ancient Egyptian mindset. And this is where Mahmoud verifies all this. Um, and this idea of living with nature was very much part of how they used to be. So if you think about it, raising obelisks was something that was done back then. We have no clue how they did it. There's no evidence. So what we effectively were doing was putting ourselves in their mindset. And then we looked at politics. And um, as many of you know, they had pharaohs and they had two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt. Um, and again, there's, there's all kinds of things about, um, you know, we looked at, but some of them were this idea that a lot of Egypt had become decentralized, even though there was a very strong hierarchy, i.e. the pharaoh was, you know, the, real, the ruler 
um, part man, part God. But we also saw that they had a highly sophisticated system of administration, tax, food storage, health. Um, you know, it was a very powerful civilization in the sense that they were very well organized, not necessarily um, going out and conquering other countries like the English did, but they certainly were well organized. So in how they organized themselves, there was a lot of this harmony and balance and order. And it's the way that the pharaoh was the overseer of keeping balance. And if he fell out with the gods or if um, uh, there was a bad season, you know, that would that would reflect on the pharaoh. So he had to keep balance. Um, so this idea of keeping balance and there being lots of stability and plenty and, you know, in the good seasons, uh, everything worked really well and the civilization was able to flourish. So it's partly the clues that we found about how well organized they were, very methodical, very living with nature, very working with cycles, not against them. Um, and thinking of how everything connects together. So the organizational side of the country, as well as how they get people working um, and also all the beliefs that they embedded coming onto religion, the beliefs they embedded in their buildings. Um, so then we looked at, you know, in their belief systems, they had all kinds of stuff to do with duality, like the upper and lower Egypt, um, and the fact that many of the gods as such, the uh, uh, the netters, had a, had a kind of male and female version or a positive and negative version. So a lot of things came in pairs. So this kind of very complex belief system that, you know, many people still can't get their head around because there, there isn't a clear picture of it. Um, but many of these gods were associated with creation and health and nature and welfare. And the pharaoh and the people did all kinds of, um, I guess you call it rituals, to keep this balance going so that the crops would be good. So there was a lot of kind of religion, politics and organization of people kind of connecting together. So highly sophisticated. And then, of course, we have the famous Matt, who is the goddess of balance and also overseer of social justice and righteousness and standing up against conflict and disorder, which was, you know, that would be a horror to the average Egyptian to have disorder. Um, everything, there was a terrific sense of balance. Um, you know, probably by having gods <laughs> that were, um, you know, you had to uh, keep happy. Um, so then looking at the architecture, we had a, we looked around, said, you know, well, how does this fit in as well? Um, and uh, uh, Gardner in 1968 said that, you know, without a strong, highly organized administration of the country, you would never have got the architectural buildings. Uh, that you see coming out in the old kingdom's time, um, because you needed that stability in order to create these great monumental building projects. Um, so we were kind of, you know, starting to build these words, culture and curiosity, material and symbolic, duality and balance. Um, and the fact that uh, these monuments were acts of national pride, uh, getting uh, people involved in building them. And trying to outdo each other on what would be each pharaoh doing something more remarkable than the one before. So bear with me because we are getting to obelisks, I promise. <laughs> um, so this, uh, you know, then we looked as we uh, we um, we felt it important to look at, uh, in particular, the British in the Middle East, um, because there was an a lot of great work done by archaeologists and Egyptologists around the time of discovery, uh, the kind of, um, you know, what was going on. So by way of introduction to that, um, the Egyptian landscape itself in the belief system was that um, working with the land and keeping everything in balance was a way to keep abundance, to keep the resources rich, keep the people happy. Um, that everybody cooperated together, and while everything went well, everybody was happy. Obviously, there were times where it didn't go so well, but these were the conditions needed for the country to keep growing when it was doing well. So coming, oh, sorry, that's this isn't the British bit yet. It's coming. I've jumped the gun a little bit. Um, so a couple of other little clues um, are that 
looks her in the past stood for well-being and the three symbols or hieroglyphs that represent looks or are these three and it is about this again coming back to balance it's the balance of life prosperity and health and so this is some of Mahmoud's thinking and looking at more contemporary times so these boys are from the 1970s they're not uh they're not very contemporary but we just both like this picture um going into more contemporary times when you look at the local people there, and I'm not talking about in cities, I'm talking more in the country, there is no waste. There's very little waste in Egypt. Everything's reused, including mud brick, uh, fabrics, and you can see this um, structure built. It's definitely made out of other pieces of things. It's improvised. So this very practical quality was something that, you know, we started to say, well, this must have been true in the past as well. Look at these things that they did. Look what they invented. And there's something that's carried through in contemporary people as well. They knew how to invent. Um, so going back to where are we now? Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the idea that, um, you know, if you build during the flood season, you could also transport things during the flood season because you've got the people building and working. So there's lots of theories about big stones like obelisks being transported up and down the Nile during flood season, for example. So again, this level of practicality, working with nature, getting everything working in an orderly way, um, was very much how they worked. And going and looking at this idea of waste, um, there's lots of ropes. These are from the British Museum, the ones on the left. So there's these ropes that were made in ancient times that are still made today. And these are made from date palm, uh, uh, what are they, fronds they call them, this kind of, um, I don't know what you call it, fiber, I think you call it. It's not the leaves, it's not the trunk, it's like a fiber that um, hangs off the trees, a bit like a webbing, you might call it. But they still make this today. Um, it's hard to find the people that can make it, but they can still make it. So this idea that, for example, the date palm, every single part is used, nothing goes to waste in it. Um, so anyway, we're about to get into the obelisk. So um, bringing everything together, we were like, OK, everything's highly organized and highly interconnected. We've got nature. So I'm looking at the list on the right. We've got nature. We've got the seasons. We've got cycles. We've got the gods, the pharaohs, the people. We've got administration, celebration. We've got all these other aspects, including duality, materiality, circularity. Um, and then this kind of direction we were going in that, well, if they were systemic thinkers, that makes sense. They thought systemically. They thought about how, how every single small part fits into the whole so it all makes sense, um, which isn't necessarily how, for example, scientists look at things. They may have an area of expertise and they'll look at that one area. Um, which comes back to how we're educated, of course. And that's important that we have experts, but this is a slightly different way of thinking where it's taking more of a big picture. So we were saying, well, is this how they achieved everything? They just, you know, had it all that thousands of years that they worked it out. Um, so what does any of this have to do with obelisks? Alhamdulillah means thank God. So we're now in the obelisk land. So this is in Karnak Temple. I know uh, many of you have been there. Um, so what this has to do with obelisks is that our first kind of insight, um, you know, and I have to give Mahmoud the credit for this, but I guess I feel very much part of the story now for lots of reasons. Um, the first insight was duality, how important that was in Egypt, in their mindset. If you put yourself in the past and you adopt the ancient Egyptian mindset and you look at obelisks, from their point of view, you start to see it very differently from, from how we look at it today. So the first clue is that obelisks were almost always found in pairs. Now We don't see evidence of that because, of course, they're all halfway across the world now as individual obelisks. So it wouldn't occur to anyone. Um, it's like there's, these are the only two photographs we could find of obelisks still in pairs, and even these are no longer in pairs. They've all been separated. They've all been transported to different places. So when you see an obelisk now, it's only a single one. 
So we look back and we, we, we did some research in not the British Library, but the, um, it's the Egyptian Exploration Society. They have a remarkable library. So Mahmoud was in the UK at the time. And we dug out these old pictures. Um, and these were the only two we could find from the past. And as I say, this doesn't exist anymore. Um, and then getting into more the, the British bit, um, Egypt was very unknown up until the, um, 1798 and Napoleon hitting there. Obviously, there was a huge amount of time where, um, you know, it was a bit of a mysterious place. Um, and it was only after Napoleon and then we get into the kind of the Europeans um, building it into their, uh, you know, must see travel list if you're, you know, your grand tour, for example, but also the discoveries being made, for example, the Rosetta Stone and trying to figure out the kind of fun, the, the kind of fascination with Egypt began um, around this time, partly led by what Napoleon was up to. Um, and then the British wanting to also get involved in uh, Egypt and then, um, you know, fighting over who gets what stone and who can translate what. So many of you will know about the Rosetta Stone. I won't go into it, but it's got a fascinating history about um, the British and the French arguing over this uh, and eventually it being deciphered and it now being in the British Museum. Um, so uh, am I, I'm not 100% I, to be honest I can't remember why I included this other than <laughs> um, the British in the Middle East uh, uh, had um, a very rich uh, connection there because they also became fascinated with the monuments uh, relocating them, uh, uh, t taking things, discovering things, and sponsoring lots of digs, uh, like the Tutankhamun one, of course. Um, so this collecting um, and discovering was, uh, you know, how all this uh, kind of new investigation of Egypt, the kind of chapter two, came about. Um, and you had great people like Amelia Edwards, who founded the Egyptian Exploration Society, who um, you know, was passionate about documenting Egyptian history. Um, I think the connection here is that how everyone documents Egyptian history uh, at that time was by finding an artifact, and then they document the artifact and look at it as an artifact. Um, whereas uh, Mahmoud and I maybe were looking at it slightly differently. We went back to the old Egyptian mindset, which is, was that, that well, it's all connected anyway. It's not about one artifact. It's about how everything fits together. And obviously, there is a lot of current thinking in that way as well. But this is what we used as a way in. Um, so our way in was to adopt, was to you know acknowledge the great discoveries made, but to also acknowledge that the history of archaeology and Egyptology is very European, you know, and, and American. And so the mindset is very European and American. So we kind of started to rustle around, and with Mahmoud's permission, because he's Egyptian, we started to look at kind of scientific exploration, how people analyze things, but also colonial preconceptions about Egypt, including, you know, well, you know, God forbid these primitive people could do anything great, you know. <laughs> there were some preconceptions there. They knew it was an amazing civilization, but there were a lot of assumptions made. Uh, by Europeans and Americans about certain things. And then before you know it, those assumptions become history. They become documented. And that's, that's well, it must be that way. So we kind of, um, we didn't challenge the assumptions. We just revisited them. Um, so uh, so we, we were bold enough to say this statement, but it's the only rude statement we had on uh, archaeology and Egyptology because our, our, our premise is not to, have an argument or to say that anybody got it wrong it's to join the conversation and actually take knowledge further that's all it is but we did acknowledge that maybe Egyptologists and engineers have been using the wrong type of thinking maybe because this you we can all be educated to become expert and that makes you deep but it doesn't make you broad and we can be very good at a part of something, like we're an expert in that. That's what PhDs do. You become a brilliant expert in new knowledge, but it's not necessarily looking at the whole. And then again, this idea of looking at things very analytically or um, the systems view, which is looking very differently. So we wondered that when people were looking at obelisk grazing, if they saw it as an engineering problem, they looked at it as how do you move this big stone 
It's a mechanical object. How did they move it? Whereas we took a step back and said, well, what else was going on around it? For example, there were always two obelisks, not one. So did that matter? Um, so this is very much what systems thinking is about. And we just decided, well, if the ancient Egyptians thought like this, then let's just keep going and put ourselves in their mindset, not our mindset. It doesn't work. So um, we, we had a lot of fun looking at contemporary stuff, tribal, you might say. Um, and we, we would laugh about the practicality. So the top left, the kind of no waste, everything's reused, all the mud. The bottom left, this is, <laughs> I don't know anybody in the United Kingdom that could do this, this, uh, this feat of engineering. Look at it. I mean, it's a health hazard. We know that. But I, I, I just, there's so many remarkable things like this. You're like, how on earth did somebody do that? Um, and we just looked at lots of different layers, including the, you know, the brilliance of the ancient civilization itself and the practicality. And then you might find this very interesting, I think, but we looked at all the brilliant work done by the French and the English and the Americans in particular and the Germans in particular, Austria as well. How did this, this obelisk get raised? So, of course, remember, they were only looking at one obelisk. Um, so Schwazi in France. Uh, thought that you pushed it off the dotted line on the left. You pushed it off the edge of a slope made of sand, and then you slowly lowered it down as you removed sand from under it, and then you took everything away. Um, nobody bought into his idea, by the way. Um, Henry Chevrier was the biggest critic of this idea. He said, that's rubbish, effectively, in a polite way. And he said, this is how it was done. So the top right shows a temple. And it shows a mound of dirt on the right. So his view was that you pushed the obelisk base first off this mound, down the slope, and then you somehow got lots of ropes to pull it upright. And within this, while you were trying to push it down the slope, sorry, I can't see it. Um, yeah, he, he thought there might have been levers involved to make sure that the obelisk didn't drop down too fast and smashed. So you had all kinds of stuff going on there. Um, and then you had Engelbach, 1923. I, um, it's been a while since I looked this, but I think he's English. Um, I have to look it up in the book. But he had a different view. And he said the Egyptians, so if you look at the top left, the Egyptians carried or rolled it, so tree trunks on rollers, on other trees that supported the obelisk, so planks we might call it, but they were actually trees. Um, they pushed it up a hill on the left. And then when they got to the top of the hill, so the hill was built. So they built a big hill first <laughs> out of sand, and then they oriented the obelisk to get ready to drop it down. And so they had this kind of cradle and somehow miraculously, they lowered it down into this hole and removed sand from the hole as they were lowering it so it didn't smash. So you can imagine the amount of work in this, huge. Thousands of people, I'm sure of it, if not hundreds. Um, so this is how they thought it must have been done this way. And then other ideas, more even more recent ones, Steve Tasker has built lots of little prototypes. And he says, no, 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 they used levers. <laughs> so you'll see in his model on the left, you have the front of a temple, this white block. So he said, no, they built these big, um, they waited for the flooding season. And then they floated the obelisk down the Nile in the flooding season. And then they got it to the temple. And then they put it on these um, structures and then they waited until the flooding season had subsided or something like that. And then using all these levers, they levered it into place. So you'll see these kind of supports transfer beams. So this was his view. They work with the flooding of the Nile and they, you know, bring the obelisk up so it's easy. It's high at water level and then the water goes down. Then we can deal with it. And then Michael, Michel Michel, who's French, and this is more contemporary, he found these clues in Hatchpitsut's temple about this obelisk that's on a boat. So you'll see the top picture and then the bottom one, it's on there. So from this, he obviously took a lot of pictures and 
uh, blew them up. And he presumed or assumed that there was actually this cradle. So you can see the obelisk in a cradle. And he said, okay, they had a ramp and they had all this, but they also had the cradle. And then they somehow used levers to lower it down. And the cradle slid down with the obelisk and then it was removed later. So this was his theory. So as you can see, there's a lot of kind of engineering thinking in this. Um, maybe less Egyptology, but definitely engineering, because it's the kind of thing that puzzles engineers. It keeps them awake at night. They want to see, well, how was it done? I'm not sure if it keeps um, Egyptologists awake at night. It might, but I think it definitely does engineers. So then we dug around after looking at all the theoretical attempts and the mini models. We looked at people who've had the audacity to try it in real life. Um, and there's a few, and they're very interesting, and many of them have been made into absolutely fascinating TV programs, PBS being one uh, channel, Nova being another. Um, so you have Michael Barnes, Mark Lerher, and Roger Hopkins who worked together. So it's like Egyptologist, engineer, stonemason. So they, um, you, you, know, you can look this up and you can even watch it on YouTube. So they looked at these ideas where you carried it up a ramp and then slid it down or lowered it down with all these ropes. Now, remember, this obelisk is, I believe, it's maybe one quarter, if not one fifth the size of the real one. Um, and I do believe they used a monolithic stone, but it wasn't the full size. So they tried all this. They kind of succeeded, kind of. Um, there were things that didn't go right. Um, so nobody has still, no one's ever done it to date. It still hasn't been done. Um, Gordon Pipes did uh, a, a very interesting one in his back garden. <laughs> um, so the picture's a bit covered, but I think he used levers and stones, and he did some very interesting experiments as well. But, of course, not full size. These are kind of more mini ones. And then at the bottom, so a handhouse studio, and I can't see the name under. I'm trying to, let me just see. I can move this box up here. Let me move the box so I can, well, I can't see it. But anyway, they did another one, and this was also televised, where you see this kind of strange cradle structure. So they attached that to the obelisk. And again, it's not full size, it's mini. And then they flipped it over on its back, on its front, and used the cradle to kind of lever it down. It's more like a rocking motion. Um, so all kinds of, you know, ingenious ways that people have attempted things. And then just to let you know that, you know, obviously somebody moved the obelisks from Egypt to Europe, USA, uh, Rome in particular. So obviously, you know, moving them wasn't an issue. Raising them is an issue. Back in ancient Egypt, when they didn't have some of the kind of more modern inventions. Um, but there's a fascinating story from 1590 about uh, a competition launched by Pope Sixtus V, who said, you know, if anybody can, we, you know, we, we have the obelisk, it's been delivered. But how are we going to make it stand up? So even they didn't know how to do it at the time um, <laughs> because they could get it on a boat, but they couldn't raise it upright. Um, so this is an absolutely fascinating book, and it's about how the obelisk was transported. Um, and then there was this competition won by Fontana. And then there's another set of amazing, uh, uh, they're kind of drawings, I guess you call it, or engravings. But these are, this is how the obelisk was raised. So they built this structure and they used, um, it says in here, I've, I haven't looked at this in a while, so I can't, can't quite remember. But anyway, they, they had a competition and this was the winning entry. And this is how they uh, raised the obelisk way back then. Um, in uh, Rome in particular. So going back to where we are <laughs> about the two obelisks, we decided that the long forgotten key was the obelisk itself. That if you think about this idea of the pairs of obelisks and that the biggest problem with an obelisk is trying to raise it is its, its center of gravity, its counterbalance, you might say. It's very difficult to do any levering with something as enormous as this. Um, but Mahmoud's thinking was, well, what if we play with the idea of counterbalance? Oh, I don't know why, but I can't move the box to see what's on the screen. Oh, actually, now I've worked it out. Yeah, I don't know what's happened to my mouse. 
gone a bit weird. But anyway, under counterbalance, you said something else that I can't read. <laughs> but it, I can see Lever thinking. So, so all of those things are what we brought together um, and just said it's part of a bigger system. It's systems thinking. The obelisks themselves are the way that they raise the obelisk. It's using the obelisk, the counterbalance of two obelisks. So, in effect, what we're talking about is instead of looking at a small part of the system, i.e. one obelisk, we kind of stood, stepped back and said, let's look at two obelisks and see how would you raise them if you use counterbalance. So, and this was Mahmoud did this one with a team of maverick Egyptians in Luxor in his back garden, I hasten to add. One day we'll all go visit it. Um, and they set themselves these rules. We are going to raise an obelisk, and we are only going to use materials available in ancient Egyptian times. So they couldn't use what was available in the Roman example, by the way. Um, I can't remember exactly what wasn't available. It was something that had been invented that we decided we, you know, it couldn't be used. Um, that the approach would be taking this systemic thinking that it had to be simple, practical, and manageable, and we had to be able to evidence it. And we would put a theory to test. And that instead of using granite, because granite's terribly expensive, um, we'd use materials like granite. So Mahmoud worked with an engineer to create a kind of concrete, reinforced concrete obelisk that had the exact same uh, qualities of granite. Um, and so the big mystery was, is this going to work at big scale? So they tried it at small scale. They didn't try it full size, but that would be the ultimate goal. So this is what they did. So now you know, at least this is our proposal, um, whether it's how it was done or not, we shall see. But if you look at the idea of counterweight, this is where you lay the two obelisks on the ground, on rollers. You attach them to ropes, which are made from date palm fiber, which, by the way, those ropes are stronger than steel rope. The reason for that is that they're kind of triple woven and it's the nature of the date palm. It's even stronger than steel rope, believe it or not. And then you have this idea that what if we put blocks in? We build a structure and then you put blocks in the middle and you can just see what's going to happen. I mean, it doesn't take an engineer to work this one out. And this is what happened. And that's Mahmoud. And there you go. So as they were raising them, they obviously had to keep uh, tension on the rope so it didn't flip too fast. But it's the weight of each obelisk is lifting the other obelisk. It's the counterbalance. That's what's doing it. So the center of gravity is always, you know, in, a, in the right way. So there's these, you know, obelisks, rollers, ropes, bricks, nets, support structure. That's all they had. And that was all available in e ancient Egypt. And there you have it. So they got them upright. And obviously, these are very small scale. They did go bigger scale. Um, I haven't shown them in here, but they did go quite a bit bigger, about three times the size. Um, and they did work. And there's, I have videos of those if anybody wants to see them. So anyway, getting back to, I guess, coming to a conclusion, um, we just decided, as you can see, that don't look at one obelisk, look at two. <laughs> look at how the duality can fit together and don't look at it as a, a, a monument. Look at it as a mechanical system, you know, and because that's what the that's what the Egyptians would have done. It's a system. It's not a monument to the gods. It's, you know, it's part of the what, what makes us who we are. And so the whole ritual behind how that was raised, I can only imagine the party they would have had at the time. Um, so for us, the next steps are we want to raise a full size one, in fact, two full size ones. So we've been kind of digging around for how we're going to do that. So the first step we did was to get the book out in the public domain with the idea. So hence, there's a book all about this um, on Amazon. Um, the experiments uh, tested the hypothesis are successful. Um, but our research, we're not intending to like annoy Egyptologists or archaeologists. We would like to complement all the beautiful work done because maybe this could bring some new insight into stuff beyond obelisks. Um, but to be honest, we're having a little bit of a challenge getting a lot of traction with Egyptology and archaeology. 
Um, you may want to figure out yourself or ask me later maybe about why that is. Um, I'm not going to talk about this slide. This is uh, more to do with the conference. But kind of in conclusion, um, this is the book. Uh, Mahmoud uh, created the design for the cover, but he didn't do this. He made it out of um, plaster of Paris with an artist friend. And if you can see, this is Matt. But he's put the obelisks in her arms because this is so Matt to have this balance, this duality. Um, so that was like a little trick we did with Matt. And then on the right, the reason I've included National Geographic is that we actually wrote to them uh, and asked for some money to raise two full-size obelisks in Luxor. Uh, so I spent a long time on the application and sadly I got the news last week that we were not successful. Um, we will keep trying. We'll probably try Egypt uh, uh, engineers and architects her type bodies because yeah, there's a, it's a little bit tricky with Egyptologists and archaeologists. And again, I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, but anyway, here is the book. If you buy it, uh, please write us a review, even if you don't like it. Because as I say, we're, we're just, we've put it out in the public domain. That was the main thing. Now we can go around and say, right, who wants to fund this? Because um, I think it would be so much fun to have a, a TV show just to do it. And it would bring, um, you know, a lot of joy to people in Luxor to kind of catalyze tourism again. You know, some interesting new stuff going on. Um, and here's the link. So um, I don't think I have anything else to say. I hope that wasn't like really boring because I know it wasn't very fun. Um, but hopefully it was interesting. So um, so thank you. So at that, this stage, I'll stop sharing. And um, Clayton, I'll let you decide how you want to take this forward or what. How, where do we go from here? <laughs> I think we can do a round of applause in the yeah. end. Okay. <laughs> and open the floor to questions. If anyone has any okay. questions you'd like to ask. Yeah. So it wasn't too heavy and boring, was it? It was all right, was it? No. <laughs> this is the right audience, so I'm kind of being slightly facetious because I know this is the right audience for this. So <laughs> I know it. But yeah, happy to happy to chat or whatever. But um. Yeah. So, a quick one for you. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, of um, things can be learned about how things were done by the um, the errors that were made. And so is 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 the Egyptian desert full of broken obelisks where they tried and failed? <laughs> um, does that give give any clues as to how they may have achieved it? Yeah, there is a very famous. Um, they call it the unfinished obelisk and it's in Aswan which is south of Luxor and it is the remains of an obelisk left in a granite quarry site and it is only semi-carved out of the stone because of course being a monolithic stone it has to be one piece so the only way to get that is to carve it out of the ground um, so that's, that's the first clue for you because it tells you um, that obelisk was far too big, and that's why it cracked. So they never tried that big again. They went smaller. Um, in terms of half broken obelisks in the desert, I my personal view is that if they could get it dug out of the granite and get it on a ship, it's not going to break. Yeah. The breaking point, the risk for breaking an obelisk is when it's being excavated out of quarry. Once you've done that, there's no risk. It's too big to break. Uh, but, the, but the first bit, that's the risk. So I, I suspect no, but of course I wasn't alive back then, believe it or not. And, you know, that could be an interesting thing to look at. Was there any evidence in the deserts? I think most Egyptologists would say that obelisks were probably transported along the Nile. That's what I suspect. I don't know if anybody's ever looked into where they transported over the desert, but, you know, that could be interesting. There could be some at the bottom of the Nile, if they saw. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. There was definitely was one. There's a, uh, the, the fight between the British and the French about who gets Cleopatra's needle is a fascinating story because it was floating around the sea on land for a long time because nobody could work out how to kind of get a grip on it. <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> I was just thinking about what James said uh, about half-broken obelisks in the desert. With what you said, I'd imagine that if that happened, they would then reuse, cut up and, uh, and repurpose the obelisks anyway, so we would probably not find... I think you're right. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah.
I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. Did you, Catherine, did you say you heard engineers look at your two obelisk raising idea? Um, uh, kind of informally in Egypt through, uh, you know, uh, people that are in uh, the local village as such or in Luxor. Informally, yes, because there, there was an engineer on the team. But in terms of us getting traction more globally, so I guess for me, I'm, a, I'm an academic. It, it, theoretically, it's easier for me. Um, and I, my observation is that I um, have been trying to uh, float this through kind of audiences, let's say, that are in the archaeological and uh, Egyptology communities. I'm getting no traction. In fact, Mahmoud and I are both getting doors closed to us. So our next step is to go the engineering and architecture route. Um, and obviously, I don't, I don't mean to be rude about archaeology and Egyptology. Of course, it's fa I'm very fascinated by them. But I think this idea is coming from outside their domain, which might upset them. And also, it might upset them, just the idea. Or they might think it's a ludicrous idea. But in some ways, it, um, I mean, there are many stories I could tell, but now it's not the appropriate form. It's probably for Mamu to tell. Um, but in terms of engineers, I'm yet to kind of step into that. So the first one would be to, I presented in Bournemouth at a conference. There were engineers there. They loved it. They loved it. And one of them put me in touch with Toby Wilkinson that some of you will know because he wrote a book uh, on the Nile. Um, so he is uh, slightly more, oh, I don't I have to be careful of my words because I don't want to be rude about um, the professions. Um, but he's someone that does seem a little bit more open-minded um, to engaging in the idea. Um, but the next step is to dig up some, you know, engineers um, and see where the right place to do that would be. Um, TV, pro TV as well. That's the other one. TV and then engineers. Hmm. I don't know if you've seen the, the chat message from Tori. He says, I was oh. just trying with National Geographic or the History Channel. I was involved with the project on experimenting with how the... Moai from Rapa Nui moves, and it took several tries before a documentary happened. So, is that right? That's what he says. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'll speak on that. Um, yeah, there are two professors, one in Hawaii and one in California, and they had a new theory on how they moved the Moai of uh, Easter Island. And um, they both had they were on a lecture circuit for about two years, um, presenting their their book before the documentary happened. So just just keep trying it. And once the National Geographic happened. Um, they actually did it. They actually repeated it twice for in other languages for other countries. Okay. So exactly. you know your your book is new, so give it some time and and spread the word. Very true. Yeah, it is brand new. You're absolutely right. We're talking three months. It's nothing. Um. So yeah, good good point. Yeah, I keep saying that to Mahmoud. I say it's going to happen. He wants it to happen yesterday because he's he's known about this idea for over ten years. There is also some wisdom in approaching a television company before an engineer, because the television company would be in it, obviously, for the spectacle and the fun. And the last thing you want is an engineer coming along very early and proving that it simply couldn't be done. <laughs> you know, well, seriously, you know, television company would right. make good, good television. It would be a fascinating program. And I've seen similar things, such as, I can't remember what it's called, one of Archimedes' weapons for destroying ships. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Television program about, you know, various ways... and. The, the design, they actually built on these things, but it's obviously crap from the early minutes of the program that it simply couldn't work. But it still yeah. made a really fascinating and fabulous program. So, yeah, I think, personally, I think it would be great to go through engineers first, but probably don't, I think, would be a good idea. Yeah, I, maybe you're right. Maybe it's the fascination of the story. Is it, I mean, let's face it, it's, the, the fascination of raising obelisks is not coming from Egyptology and archaeology. It's coming from the public. <laughs> Yeah, and also it'd be just it really as much is. fun from the television point of view if the whole thing shattered at the very yes. last moment. That's true. That's true. That would make great TV. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, because all the previous attempts didn't quite work either. So why shouldn't we join that club? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but you know, and maybe we'll inspire a 12-year-old who will crack the idea of how they were raised. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe. So, yeah, but we'll see. Uh, 
I just just offered a tangent. I mean, the, the thought of all these broken obelisks in the desert, as, as you probably found, I've only been to Egypt once, but potting around, at, you know, some of the, the great tombs and look at the marvellous, you know, paintings on the walls. I think I was yeah. at Nefertiti's too. One thing which really struck me was if you go down, you know, slightly not commonly used corridor, you often find really crap mm. art. Yeah. They had the professionals doing it, and round the corner was their drunken apprentice coming up with really shit quality pictures, which they <laughs> yeah. were happy to, to leave there and, you know, accept. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was fairly crap broken obelisks. Yeah, you, 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 you could done. well be right, but um, knowing the locals today, they if they found broken obelisks, they're probably using them as their kitchen table or something right now, you know, and not even knowing it, you know, you just don't know. There's Stranger things have happened, um, but yeah, there is a lot of uh, a lot of crap art, also unfinished art, because of course the yeah, minute Pharaoh huh? died, it doesn't matter about finishing it anymore. Just let the men seal it up. <laughs> yes, I can't remember the tomb. I think it was in the Valley of the Queens where the guide said, "We think this is the moment when the news came through that the sponsoring Pharaoh had died." Yeah. Because the work finishes mid brushstroke, and obviously at that point you'll go, all right, solve that for game, solve Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you're yeah. gone, you're gone. <laughs> yeah. what, what sort of size are we talking about for a full size oh, obelisk um, replica? I mean, not wishing to put you on the on the spot, obviously. Yeah, I I wish Mahmoud was here because he's the he's the real factoid man. He he can you know quote names, numbers, data, everything. Um. Should I look it up? <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd have to look it up. Let me just see. Um, I know that the one that cracked was a thousand tons, I think. So they now are around 900. So they keep it just below. There's the unfinished obelisk. I don't know if you can see that. That's it in the granite um, quarry. It's a dark shape. Uh, that's an unfinished obelisk lying in the ground. Um, Oh, here we go. So this one that cracked was planned to be 137 feet high and 1,170 tons in weight. So that was too heavy and too high. So they are all under that height. Um, how much under it, I'm not sure. But that was an experiment that went wrong. So they, yeah, after that, didn't try anything that big anymore. They went down. What are you thinking? There's a few bags of concrete and cement down the park and... <laughs> give it a go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. This Why not? Why? The B and Q will get some bags of cement. Uh, oh, that would not be great. Mm. Wait till the weather's a bit warmer. Warmer. You don't want to be slipping on any ice right now. <laughs> Catherine, you're saying the Washington Monument is not an obelisk because it is not a monolith. Um, it's not an obelisk because it's not from ancient Egypt. It's not, well, another way to phrase that, it's not one of the obelisks that came from ancient Egypt because there's many all around the world that were, uh, you know, um, dismantled and relocated. The Washington Monument was a commission as such to make a remarkable structure just for Washington. It was done, it's much more contemporary than an ancient obelisk. So I knew that, but I, I don't, it still qualifies strictly as an obelisk, though, doesn't it? Um, and it and uh, does an obelisk have to be an ancient structure? Again, I'm probably, I, I don't know. I've never been asked that. Um, I never looked it up. My, if my mood was here, he would answer that straight away for you. I, um, I did strictly so I look know. it up, you see, while, while you were... Oh, good. Asked. Okay. So what's the answer? <laughs> well, this is it. It's not raising, because it, it does actually clearly describe it, at least in Wikipedia, as an obelisk. Okay. Yeah. Is it okay. made in sections, did it say? Sorry, um, it made it didn't, in I only read a little bit. It didn't say in sections, but it said made of several materials. So I, I you know, it's obviously not a monolith. Obviously. So yeah, it's, it's not, not a monolith. Direct, that's all. Sorry, Clayton. I just wonder if it would make it easier to erect if it was in sections. Uh, I would imagine so. Yes, um, I, I generally don't. I don't know whether it actually whether it's constructed in sections or uh, erected in sections. I don't know. But, Is it uh, faced brickwork? I. I, it, when you look at it up close, it's blocks. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know if you want to answer that, but because you're on Wikipedia, maybe. <laughs> well, according to the <laughs> right. according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, yeah, it is an obelisk is monolithic. Okay. All right. Well, I've learned something. 
And we have it, a fight between it, Wikipedia it, and the Encyclopedia Britannica then. It, that is, they consist of a single stone. Wow. A modern, okay. a modern obelisk. So they seem to be dividing it between a real obelisk and a modern obelisk. Oh. What's the monument? Every, everyone, is, uh, is everyone is right. Everyone is right. So what's that about the Washington <laughs> Monument? The Washington um, Monument is made of blocks. It's not a solid piece of stone. Right. It's, it's, it's rather almost like brickwork that's then been faced. So you can see it's something. much easier to be rigged. Yeah. yeah. Faced with aluminium cladding, so there's going to be an extremely expensive <laughs> project for the three years to strip it all off. It's going to be that flammable cladding, is <laughs> <laughs>